Fred is difficult to introduce because of all the great work that he has done to make this place possible. Fred is now doing some very serious work with, uh, through Princeton University and the Simons Observatory. Um, let, let me let Fred talk a little bit more about what that is. He is doing super work, groundbreaking work. And I guess that it's his time to do that kind of thing because uh, he's already saved Camp Evans. We are a national historic landmark due to his efforts. And we're happy that that has happened because we will be here in the future. And Fred, can you uh, go ahead and take it away? Thank you, Lori. Uh, it is truly a thrill to be here. I'm trying to find the proper screen to share. And thank you for that nice introduction. Let's see. Oh, good. All righty. Let me see. I'm having a little trouble going to slideshow mode. So can you see uh, my screen? Yes. OK. Uh, I have an auxiliary screen. And when I go to slideshow, slideshow mode, it shows up there. So I'll just work from here if that's OK. The challenge, radar astronomy is a technique of generating energy and bouncing them off large targets. The challenge is that nasty inverse square law. So that's, that's the main problem. And uh, if those of you remember Tim the Tool Man, more power, more power, that's been the history of radar astronomy, getting more power. This is what I find amazing at this site. It was first put together on the thought that you could use the luminous ether to move radio waves across the Atlantic, where later they would find out, thanks to Oliver uh, Heaviside, that there was a layer in the atmosphere called the ionosphere, and that was actually bouncing the uh, radio waves across the ocean from Wales to what we now call Camp Evans. So it is really amazing that a site that depended on the heavy side layer, going all the way back to Marconi, is the one that actually demonstrated that you could pierce the ionosphere and bore the birthplace of a new branch of astronomy called radar astronomy. F fantastic. And, you know, um, you know, the old joke, wait, wait, there's more. Well, later they used the site for your ionosphere research, uh, moon surface study. Uh, the TLM-18 would start Earth observation, regular Earth observation by satellites, which changed so many sciences by feeding them tons of data, daily weather images, the birth of satellite tracking, and as Lori alluded to, spying on the Soviets. Wow. And now it's a historic site and it's a working educational site. Thanks to Dan and the team from Princeton, it is beyond the dream. Um, its first use is a radar astronomy site after bouncing off the moon is alluded to in Dr. Zoll's Electrons Away book, where uh, a professor from Princeton, John Quincy Stewart, there's his photo next to Dr. Zoll, um, they attempted to track drachnoids, drachnids, and uh, they were more or less successful. Um, but it was tough because it comes back to the power, right? Now, to get the power, you needed military equipment. And sort of like the history of radar astronomy is tied to getting military support. So Diana was a reused SCR-271D. Um, the Lincoln Laboratory with their work at um, bouncing radar uh, signals off of Venus, uh, another leftover um, military device. Arecibo, as most of us know, is uh, no longer operational and it's sad, but that was sort of like the apex of 
uh, radar astronomy. And again, it comes down to you need a place to either transmit the signals, bounce them off your object, and receive them back. In the case of Arecibo, it could do, mo do both. Um, here's an asteroid that was characterized by radar astronomy because now, like all astronomy, you just don't need equipment. You need computers to put your images together and take out clutter, right? So I, I've, I've been very lucky. Um, and um, it, it is so much fun to be part of the current work in learning more about the cosmic microwave background, which started in um, Homedell, New Jersey, with some uh, lucky Nobel Prize winners who uh, had a background noise, as many of you know. And it turned out Princeton was looking for that noise, and uh, they were scooped. Whoops. So here is Dr. Brian Keating, um, one of the gentlemen I work with. Uh, in a Zoom meeting, he uh, complained that his whole career was with cosmic microwave background study, and he had never been to Homedell. So I uh, said, Brian, next time you're in New York City, I will drive into the city, and I hate driving in the city. Pick you up, take you to Homedell, take pictures of you in front of the dish for your next book, and um, that happened and I brought them back to uh, Newark Airport. It was fun. But this is what him and his underwriter and his team are doing. They are making the best to date set of telescopes to learn more about the cosmic microwave background by getting more, I guess you could compare it to a bigger pixel set of cameras, okay? And because they, they want to answer the big question, right? What is out there? Right? And this has been a perplexing thing for mankind because our first telescope was our eyeballs. Then Kepler came up with the first artificial aid, the telescope. And, and we kept going through these demotions where we were the center of the universe, and God and all the angels were around us, making sure we were okay. Well, the sun's in the middle, and now we're the third rock from the sun. And whoa, wait a minute. Our little planetary thing is just one star among the Milky Way in a galaxy, and we're spinning. And wait a minute, those stars out there, they're not stars, they're other galaxies. And then whoa, it's expanding. So with better and better tools, we learned more and more and found more things. So part of the advance in astronomy is not just the brilliant people who come up with the theories. It is the tool makers who enable more information to come in, right? So the Big Bang was theorized. Okay. How you like this view? The idea was um, 380,000 years after the start of the Big Bang. Um, you had photons given off. And after all this time, you should be able to find those photons. And again, it was done in Homedell, New Jersey. Here's, here's another view of the Big Bang. And the hope is by finding more data, you can predict where galaxies will be formed or galaxy clusters, okay? So what is the cosmic microwave background? When it started or the expansion of whatever was out there, the big kernel, um, you had sort of a primordial soup and there was so much energy, you couldn't have electrons get in orbit around a nucleus. So eventually, as it expanded and cooled, you had this time called the recombination where the um, photons came off, and that's our, what we're looking for. And again, it's been a project progress in resolution. Um, here's our Homedell horn. 
That's our one pixel camera. And then a satellite was created that could uh, find the microwave background and look at a better resolution. They found there was relative hot and cold spots. And then uh, here's WMAP named after uh, Wilkinson, right? Notice you have a better resolution. Well, now here's the team working uh, thanks to the, the gifts of the uh, Simons Foundation, this team of amazing PhDs and leaders in their field are leading this team of 200 scientists and staff um, to create the next tool to find more about the cosmic microwave background. Uh, this is us at Berkeley. Each year, the team has a, um, a team meeting and um, because of this pesty pandemic, the team was going to meet in Princeton and we were arranging tours for those interested to come to InfoAge. And uh, you know, the, you know, not the only thing that got canceled. So here's, here's the team I work with directly in Princeton and they, they are just amazing. I've been with some of these uh, students when they were uh, just new graduate students and um, one of the joys of being part of this team is Dr. Staggs watching her give the students more responsibility. And I've watched them grow from timid little graduate students or postdocs to real confident young scientists. It is really neat. And um, it, it is a gift and I am so thankful for it. So our challenge is to get us light. But the problem is we just don't want any light. We want the cosmic microwave background. So we have a lot of problems. There's clouds out there, there's dust. We gotta concentrate the light with lenses. You can only see so far at a time. Do you like my pun there? Um, uh, now the other problem is too much light from other things like the sun. You can have reflections from with light coming in that you don't want. There's issues with physics and there's instrument effect. So we'll talk about some of these. Here is one of the um, lenses or, or devices, uh, a cross section that goal is to capture photons, have them uh, fil uh, filtered through filters, okay? catch things on the side that are reflected, take away unwanted heat generated by the, the energy of those photons hitting the um, filters, and then having them picked up by what's akin to our iris at the back, and then sending data to computers to do at analysis. So it takes advantage of a phenomenon discovered with the drops of mercury uh, called superconductivity. And if you set the, um, certain uh, substances at the right temperature and a photon, photon comes in and hits it, it will change resistivity. And using a concept that I believe Ray and Al and company have a wee stone bridge at the thing. This tried and true concept put in miniaturization can actually detect a photon hitting um, in the telescope, okay? And here's a comparison. The um, Homedale Horn is a one pixel device. Look at the size of it, okay? And uh, here is one of the feed horns in one of the arrays that we'll learn more about. Okay. So here we're looking at the um, akin to the iris. Okay. And here's where these um, uh, either lenses are or feed horns that are capturing light coming in, right? And the challenge is to detect the light and then turn it into electrical pulses to go into computers. And it is microelectronics at its key. This is a clean room located at Princeton. And 
uh, this is a, one of the postdocs working on doing um, a loop connections. I'll show you more because look at the tiny circuits you have here. Each behind each lens and behind each um, cone to focus them on is a tiny circuit that when it hits this bolometer, it sends a pulse down here and each one of these has a different size and a different wavelength that'll send out a microwave to be captured in its time frame because they do time division multiplexing. So now these photons are very cold because they've been traveling for billions of years. So they're now in the low energy microwave um, state. So you need something to cool them down to nearly um, uh, absolute zero. And they use these amazing uh, pulse, pulse tube coolers and um, to bring things down to near absolute zero. And they're kept in vessels called cryostats, which are like, think of Russian dolls. Okay? Well, inside the tiniest doll is the electronics and each layer protects the inside layer from the heat of the outside environment. Because us here enjoying our, I guess it's like 380 Kelvin, if, if I don't have that wrong, we're nice and warm. Uh, you, can't, you can't detect the photons that you want with that, okay? So um, originally the device was called a camera because it is akin to a camera. And here's all the layers of your Russian dolls, okay? Each layer insulates it and you have to carry out on very thin wires that will not give off too much heat that could be picked up by the bolometers as photons, you want to get it to computers. Again, you have filters to take out um, infrared rays and things that you don't want to hit your bolometers. Here again are cross sections of the two different um, uh, optics tubes. And notice at the back of each one, you have your electronics. So you want to inside. Um, those of you who are uh, have visited Camp Evans, there was a building, a Quonset hut, that had thousands of these um, uh, cones that was like an anacolic chamber. Well, inside of these optic tubes, it's sort of like an anacolic chamber. Any photon that comes from a reflection from something that you don't want or is generated from the um, filters as heat, you want to capture. And of course, the refrigeration will take that heat away. Now, what's unbelievable to me, it's one of those things that until you see it, you can't believe it. Um, as you know, light waves, if they line up crest to crest, will complement each other and boost the signal. But if they don't line up, they can cancel one another. And so the lenses, they will lose light coming in through reflection off the front surface and the inner inside surface. So look at here with no AR coding and notice you have areas where the light is canceling out in the dark areas and where light is being magnified because of the uh, crests of wave light waves hitting one, uh, lining up together and complementing one another. So the lenses are in the process, and this is happening right now because these uh, telescopes are being built all over the world. Um, I believe it's in the University of Chicago. They are taking lenses, sapphire lenses, and running tiny blades across them in multiple passes, 
first pass to get this depth, second pass to get it a little wider, third pass. And believe it or not, when the light waves hit this, more of them go into the lens and further than if it was a completely smooth surface. Okay, again, baffling to uh, capture the stray light. Here, here is the cryostats. This is the large cryostat, which goes inside here in this giant telescope that is six meters across at the opening. And each one of these, uh, there's two mirrors that reflect the light into the um, cryostat. And this cryostat was, and was manufactured and still is at the University of Pennsylvania. And each one of those cryostat is set up to hold um, 13 optic tubes of which the experiment will um, put in the initial six. And here's the size compared to humans. Um, these are graduate students. Now, the challenge is you get a lot, a lot of things coming in because there's a lot of busy stuff out there in the sky. So you need sophisticated computer algorithms to go through and pull out of all the light coming in what's potential microwaves coming from a star, coming from a galaxy, uh, coming from um, maybe dust, okay? So it is, it is quite, quite the job and that's part of the leading edge of this uh, experiment and it's open source um, work and there are people all over the world in dozens of universities contributing their expertise to this, um, these algorithms. So here's what we see out in the At Atacama Desert, out in Chile, where it's about 17,000 feet high. And at the beginning of this experiment, when I got involved, people said, would you wanna go to Chile? And I was like, uh, yeah, it sounds like fun. But then as I learned more that to walk around the site, you need oxygen. And one of the major components are being built in Italy. Another one is being built in Germany. Uh, you know, they both have better beer. They have lots of oxygen and Italy has gelato. So um, I put my hat in the ring to go to uh, those sites. But again, we're back to that pesky pandemic. So this is what the telescope sees at 2.7 Kelvin. And with the work of those sophisticated computers, this is what the, the data analysis shows. And the site, the Simons Observatory, um, this is where the new telescopes will go. Um, the telescopes are being, the design of the telescopes are being used by other projects so this is not just a one-off. This may serve cosmology for the next 50 or more years because you'll be able to put in new optic tubes with the latest um, cryogenic knowledge or the, the newest materials and techniques. So it's really thrilling. And I want to go back. and highlight Dr. Jim Simons, who is retiring from his foundation, the Simons Foundation, who doing um, analysis and algorithms of why people buy stocks as a professor, a mathematics professor um, in Columbia, formed a limited liability company that I'm told is a legend in the industry, a uh, Renaissance Corporation. And when he had had enough fun, he had $18 billion in his back pocket. And um, so he's formed this foundation with 85% of his 
fortune and he's kept 15% for himself and his family. And as he puts it, that's more money than he could ever use. So um, he is a great philanthropist. And another one is um, uh, Dr. Keating had invited him to come and visit InfoAge. And of course that pesky pandemic again, but we're marching forward in spite of it, even though the grad students and the postdocs are limited in the time and the number of people that they can get in their laboratory at once, the project is moving on and making forward. And we project that we've only lost uh, 5.4 months in this endeavor. So uh, thank you. And any questions? Fred, are you in the picture? It, uh, there's my uh, smiling little face. It was, it was really fun. It was a great couple of days to be in Berkeley. And um, here's Dr. Keating. Um, oh boy, um, Devlin from University of Pennsylvania, the new head, uh, David Sergal of the uh, Simons Foundation, because uh, Jim Simons is retiring. Um, it, it's it's really fun. It, like I kid people, I, I am, I am a you know a science person, uh, like a baseball fan, and I'm getting to work with the Yankees, and it's it's an it's the thrill of my lifetime. And there's times where I think, what was the bigger thrill, Camp Evans, or Simon's Observatory? It, it's it's a blessing to have such a problem you can't figure out what's the best thrill in your life so um that's it hello are you still there yeah this is pat this is pat i just can't i had to leave but i came back and got the the latter part of your presentation uh, especially that involving the super uh absorb dark absorbent um baffles that uh, remove extraneous light. It turns out that I just read like three days ago an article about use of nano carbon nanotubes, mm -hmm. uh, which are a, a whole new technology. They found a use that looks very much like that for uh, structures made out of carbon nanotubes that are awesomely blacker than black and, and extremely low reflectivity. I don't know if you're interested in that, but um, it was a feature article in one of the technology magazines. Okay. It, was was it based on the work of Dr. Akito Kusaka of the University of Tokyo? Yeah, uh, uh, that sounds about right. I said, uh, uh, I'd have to look at it again, but um, uh, I have the magazine somewhere else right now, but um, okay. uh, it, it could be, I don't know. Right, back to back to living the dream. You know what I mean? Get I get to talk to that gentleman uh, <laughs> twice a week, uh, among others. In a similar way, my hobby of moon bounce has introduced me to <laughs> some really incredible people, Nobel scientists, and mm -hmm. who happen to be moon bouncers, and other people like over at Arecibo. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I know that I know that thrill, uh, uh, even looking from the sidelines. Yep. All right, so I can send, I can, I can connect with you somehow and send you that article if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, it's it's simple. F C A R L F Carl at Princeton dot edu. Excuse me, I have, I have a. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I have a uh, technical question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, these um, cryogenic telescopes, what wavelength bands do they work in? Whew. Um, I should know that right off the top of my head, because um, there we refer to them as uh, medium frequency, low frequency, and high frequency. But I I can't give you that off the top of my head. It's all different microwave frequencies. Uh, are these the characteristic frequencies of temperatures around three Kelvin? Uh, the, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, I can calculate it. That's all right. Thanks. Well, you can go to a website. Um, uh, simonsobservatory.org, I think it is, or just okay. um, Google Simons Observatory. And there are papers describing the instrument in more detail than I can keep in, in um, my head. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. 
Thanks.